Welcome to another episode of What's Working in E-Commerce. I'm your host, Egan Heath. I own the digital marketing agency, Caravan Digital, where we help with paid search, paid social, and email automation. Today, I'm excited to have on someone who's very skilled at selling educational products, and he's also the writer of a very successful newsletter. His name is Ollie Richards. Ollie, thank you for joining us. It's a real pleasure to be here. Ollie, tell us a bit about your business and kind of your path to where you are now. Yeah, so I'm someone who's done something completely different every seven years of my life. Um, so I, I like to think of my life in terms of seven year careers. So um, at college, I did a degree in jazz music. So I was playing jazz piano for seven years and then playing, playing music professionally. I kind of fell out of love with that. I became an English teacher and I went to live all around the world teaching English. I lived in Japan, in Qatar, where the World Cup's just been, in, uh, in Egypt. And, um, and then during that time, I kind of, I began blogging about my other passion, which had always been learning foreign languages. And I, so I ended up building a, my, my third seven year career, which was, um, blogging about learning languages. That was the one that really took off and I found myself continuing to do. So I ended up growing that business, which is called story learning, um, into, a multi-million dollar online education business. Uh, that's been my my gig for the last 10 years or so. Um, and then more recently, I've pivoted into actually writing um, a newsletter about building online education businesses because I've done so much of it that I wanted to talk about um, what I'm doing in my businesses, what's working for us and um, what other people can learn from it. So yes, yeah, that leads us to the present day. I love it. Wow. So many exciting things in there. I can certainly relate to that seven year itch as well. If I'm about that yeah. number of, you know, I started as a running a local SEO and Google ads agency, you pivot into, into, you know, e-commerce and lead gen and things like that. And I'm always like looking at, looking at what's the next thing. And uh, so this podcast has been a fun part of that too. I'm, I'm curious when you get to the end of one of those cycles, how do you know it's time to do something else? You just know, you feel it in your bones. I mean, I'm, I think that I talked to my wife about this, you know, she, I like it, at every stage of my career, I've just had this, this pressure build up inside me about how I want to be spending my time. And I've, and I just, I just, I, I can't, I, it's impossible for me to resist that. I just, uh, I, I just feel, um, compelled towards a new direction. And, and, and I just, I just take it and I've always been fairly, um, I've always been fairly quick to take the leap. I think after you've taken leaps like this a few times, you kind of develop the, the courage to do so and the trust in yourself that it is possible to do and that you're not, that you're going to be okay no matter what. So it, it's really just been, um, a case of following my intuitions and how I want to spend my time and what I want to do with my life. Hmm. I appreciate you talking about that. I, I think I sort of think about it of this sort of trade off. There's this feeling of it takes a good number of years to really get good at something, to get a reputation in the marketplace, you know, to be in a position to really be able to help people and then also, you know, make a living that way or make a good living that way. You've obviously made it work here. And I, I, I gather in, you know, in one of those seven year cycles, you had at least one very successful business, if not multiple. So that's, that's very heartening to hear. I want to hear, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Anything yeah, else well, to say I, mean, about I was, was going to say that, that, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of this is age dependent as well. You know, I, I don't think mm -hmm. I would, you know, I'm in the fortunate position now of, of having a, a, a successful business, but I also have a family. So I would not be quite so cavalier now in, 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 you know, running off and learning to be a gardener or something, nothing against gardening. I just, I assumed that it wouldn't pay enough to support the, the lifestyle we've, we've developed. A lot of the early experimenting was in my, in my twenties and early thirties. And, you know, you, you do have. I think a lot of people have a bit more time and flexibility at that age to do things. It's just, I guess, in my case, it's just I'm fortunate that the the, the financial success has come at a helpful, convenient point of my life. And that this story learning business, then, of I'm looking at the website here. I may even pull it up and show it just so people can see it. It's about learning learning languages. You've done this many times over. You know, how yeah. did you get started on learning languages? And is it, is it quite different from how people learn in school? Yeah. So, I mean, I did, did, I did languages at school, like, like everyone else. 
um, you know, in here in the UK, you have to do at least well, at the time you had to do at least one language. I did French um, and, you know, wasn't particularly good at it. But then I ended up, um, I mean, it's a funny story, really. I, I, I was going out with a girl who, who, who broke up with me um, and sent me in a complete spiral. And it just so happened that she had spent the previous year of her life uh, living in Paris. And um, for some reason, when she broke up with me, I thought that going to Paris would be the solution to my problem. So I quit university. I, I literally bought a one-way ticket on the Eurostar to Paris. And I just started to fend for myself. And I learned French there just through necessity. And um, again, a bit like this, the whole seven-year career thing. Once you've learned one foreign language, it just gives you the confidence to learn another. So I just kind of carried on and learned, learned multiple of them, one after the other. Um, and that's just, yeah, again, it's just how I've, how I, I'm, I'm just wired that way. I just, I like to do and learn new things. Mm -hmm. I see about your method on your website here, storylearning.com. My method, story learning helps you learn a new language quickly through stories, not rules. And that's, what's different from school because it's the rules that everyone remembers, right? It's the grammar points. It's the learning lists of vocabulary and things like that. And so, yeah, I mean, our method of learning of teaching languages at story learning comes from my own experience. And I, I, I discovered, I mean, I'm not the first, I'm, I'm not the first person to discover the power of stories for learning languages that that's thousands of years old, but I discovered it for myself, um, you know, about 10, 10, 15 years ago or so. And it worked really well for me. And so as I, as I later started to build my, my business and write about it, I just decided to make stories the, the central focus because that that's what, worked for me is what I liked and it so happens that it works really well for other people as well and so I just kind of lent into that and, and really made a point of building the brand around it and I think it works primarily because the human brain is hardwired to communicate through stories you know that's how information is passed down the, you know, the um, all the great books of the past have been passed down in stories and even the bible was only written down hundreds of years after the events actually happened the rest of the time is just told through stories. So we are predisposed to learn through stories. And so what we do at story learning is kind of codify that method and make the actual learning part more predictable and, and user-friendly. Wow. And I can see on the site, you've got quite a few, I'm counting maybe 17 languages. Yeah, it's um, quite a few. <laughs> are, you, are, are you teaching each of these or you've no, got teachers no, no. that are helping on the different ones? Okay. Yeah. No, I often get asked that. No, I mean, the first, the first one. So, I mean, I recorded the Spanish course and the Japanese course myself, because those are two languages that, wow. well, I mean, the Spanish came mm -hmm. first. So I kind of did it myself as a, as a, as an MVP. Um, and then later on, we couldn't find a good Japanese teacher who spoke English well and, and could, was good with technology and making online products. So I just said, right, I'm going to, I speak Japanese. I'm going to, I'm going to record the, the Japanese course myself, but all the others, we work with partner teachers who come in, who understand the method and who help us with the delivery. How cool. I guess as we turn to maybe the marketing you've done for this, I'm sort of reminded of, you know, we, we're sort of brought up in school to think it's all about credentials and your schooling and everything like that. And I think <laughs> I would guess you would maybe agree, you know, your business kind of shows, Hey, if you can, if, if I did this and I can show you how I did it, or I've, I've taught other people and it worked for them. Um, you know, it's basically, that's it. I can get people results and I've got proof. That's a business right there. It is. I mean, and that's the foundation of the creator economy now, um, you know, with whatever you want to call it, the creator economy, the expert economy, mm -hmm. you know, hmm. essentially until the, the, the advent of the internet, the all knowledge was had a gatekeeper you know, news had to pass through the major publishers, the major TV channels. Um, languages were taught in textbooks that you had to buy from a shop. The internet had democratized all kinds of, or all information for better or for worse, not always for the better, you know, it's, the, it's a, it could be for the worse as well. But what the, what the internet does is it allows people to live out this, this human truth they have, which is attachment to real people. We all remember our favorite teacher from school. Mine was a teacher called Mr. Simmons. He was a big, jovial guy, super nice, always had, always had time for us, listened to everything we wanted to say. I would have learned anything from him, even if he didn't know how to teach it. We like to learn from our favorite teachers. And so what the internet allows us to do is to put ourselves out there, not necessarily as the most experienced, credentialed, highly qualified people, but people who have a certain life experience um, can teach that 
and other people will value that. And so this allows people to learn in different ways. Perhaps, you know, people don't get on with regular textbook language lessons. Um, they, they may find that the stuff that we teach does work for them. And so the internet allows for that, for that, for that democratization of, of knowledge. Yeah, love that subject. This came up a bit with um, Tim and Scott from Paddle Smash, and we were sort of saying, you know, how should this change even how do we educate children now? If you don't just write for the teacher, write a blog for many people. You know, that's almost the, the one to many way. That's how you get leverage. That's interesting. I also like in uh, Russell Brunson's book, Expert Secrets, he says, you know, wherever you're at, whatever you've done, um, you've done something other people haven't, and you can show them. Even if you're just almost a chapter ahead in the book, you know, even if you're just a little ways ahead of them, you're an expert and you can get them to that next level. So there's always somewhere to start. Yeah. I mean, the, the irony is that if, if you, as easy as it is to begin an expert business of some kind, um, it typically doesn't scale very well. So, you know, it's, it's relatively straightforward to build a, to build a creative business to six, maybe even low seven figures, but to scale beyond that, you very as the expert or the creator you very quickly become the bottleneck and so the what works for you what got you there doesn't well, how does how's the saying go what got you what here, got you here get, won't get you there doesn't get you there mm -hmm. and so a lot mm -hmm. of the work that i've had to do in the last four or five years at story learning is actually learn to build a brand and an actual business and make it so that the product and the marketing and, and the operations equally um are functioning beyond me and without me in spite of me all of, all of those different things and that's what um that's what allows you to actually scale um, a knowledge-based business that's well put I, i'm looking at you know your bio here i see you have a, a book called case study anatomy of a 10 million dollar online education business i also see on your linkedin about scaling strategies from hobbitshire so very cool um i gather you've done this you figured out how to how to get to that next level. I've just got to ask you on the, on the marketing piece, you know, how do people learn about uh, story learning and uh, yeah, what, what channels have you found have re really been helpful to drive, uh, you know, subscribers and purchasers? Yeah. So many different channels. Um, the, it, it started off just as a blog and then I added on, I, I've, I've essentially gone and added on lots of different media over time. So I added on a podcast, which I later retired. Um, then I added on a YouTube channel. Um, which I did nothing with. And then I added, I added a, a, a language specific YouTube channel, a Spanish YouTube channel, which I did and then retired. Um, and then, um, that then started up again over time. So we've used the three main types of media. So audio text and, and, and video and made a lot of mistakes in, in the process. For example, shutting down my Spanish YouTube channel, uh, back in 2018 was a terrible mistake because I just hadn't given it enough time to actually, uh, to actually blossom and get traction. One of the things you learn about building media is that it's a three to five year play. If it's something that you need ROI from immediately, you're, you're in trouble. You really have to be in it for the long term. So, you know, I started to scale these, to, to add these different kinds of media and then built systems and teams around it. So for example, now we have a Spanish podcast, we have a Spanish YouTube channel, none of that involves me at all it's all completely managed by the team using systems that we've built and then on top of that you layer other forms of marketing because what, one of the things i'm very strict about is i don't like any single form of marketing to account for more than 30 percent of revenue because it puts you in a very precarious position should things change so on top of that we add we have books which are very powerful um, customer-led um, customer acquisition system um, very interesting books really because by the time, let's say someone buys your book and then finds you, they are already a customer because they've already given you money. So it makes them actually uniquely qualified to, um, to find you and, and your world and, uh, and you actually earn money from them <laughs> appearing on your doorsteps, which is quite cool. But adding on top to that, things like referrals, affiliates, uh, more traditional media, um, and then paid advertising, influencer marketing, things like that. We do a bit of everything these days. And, and um, what we are working on internally right now is 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 figuring out the best ways to scale the paid side of the media that we do um into different into different avenues because that's a whole 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 other kettle of fish but really story learning works on the basis that people come from all all kinds of different places i see you're a big advocate of diversifying then those marketing channels and not getting too concentrated in any one is it well after is a it certain okay? point yeah. 
this is mm-hmm. the interesting thing. So this is something that mm-hmm. always provokes an a, a sort of irritated or confused response. So I have a, a mantra that I talk about on my in my newsletter at uh, ollierichards.co, which is that you should not diversify anything you do until you're reaching at least seven figures in revenue. And the reason is that let's say that you are building your business based on a podcast and you you run into growth bottlenecks. So you can't grow the business anymore. What most people do at that point is they add on a new media channel. So they say, right, let's, let's, let's do YouTube as well. So we'll do podcast and we'll do YouTube. In reality, it's a mistake. I mean, well, assuming that the podcast is a viable growth channel in the first place, which it may or may not be, but assuming that your actual, your, your, your main content platform is a, is a viable channel, it's always a mistake to add a new one because the real work you need to do is to figure out how to scale that primary channel. And most people, rather than doing the work of figuring out how to scale that channel, instead add new things which is really just a cry for help. It's really just a way of saying, maybe this thing will work, or maybe that thing will work. But the real work is to focus on that core channel and figure out how to grow that. And that's something that very few people do. The time to start diversifying traffic sources is once you've got your existing sources to a point where they can be systematized and handed off. Because as long as everything relies on you in order to function, it's just a disaster waiting to happen. So it's about scaling something to escape velocity, if you will, doing the hard work of figuring out how to grow it, even when growth is tough and stalls. And then once you've figured out the magic formula, you systematize it, you hand it off to your team, and then you start working on the other one. Um, And so diversification above seven figures, great idea. Pre seven figures, generally not a good idea. That's fascinating. And was that first channel blogging and SEO? For me, it was, yeah. Yeah. And And I will say I did not like the the reason I'm confident about saying this now is because I didn't do that myself. You know, I I spread myself thin between blogs, YouTube channels, podcasts. um, And what I've learned subsequently is when you do something well, it takes off beyond your, you know, beyond your, your, your wildest imagination. And you realize, damn, if I just figured out how to do that in the first place, then things would look very, very different now. You know, so for example, um, our our language YouTube channel, our main language YouTube channel, um, has has grown a lot in recent years. We're at approaching four hundred thousand subscribers. Um, that's happened quite quickly in the space of a couple of years, and it happened when I made the decision. You know what? I'm going to learn YouTube this year. So I sort of sat down. I took responsibility for my for it myself. I took courses. I worked with consultants. I trialed a whole bunch of stuff, and I figured out how to grow YouTube. Only I could have done that for our business, really. Even though we've got great, talented people on the team, there's something about the founder, content creator, marketer personality that has the drive to actually push forward and develop new new content. But it was by taking responsibility for developing that that the channel really took off and went from, I think it was 30,000 to now almost 400,000. And, but I, 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 so when I see that happening, I think, man, I could have, I could have learned to do this back in 2015. I just got bored and distracted and, and decided to try something new. So it was a huge lesson in, um, in, in, you know, trying to not, in not spreading yourself too thin too soon. Hmm. It certainly makes sense. I want to play devil's advocate a little, and maybe I'm just yeah, being please. defensive or something, but my thought is almost uh, the repurposing of we can do an episode, we can be on YouTube, I can have an audio podcast, we can turn it into a blog post and use that in the email newsletter. Am I off base there? So re- so the proof is in the pudding ultimately, right? And so what I normally see in this kind of situation is that repurposing becomes a for the sake of it type activity. So you end up with the blog post, you have the audio for the podcast, you have the video, but no single channel get much traction in particular. So yes, you have a presence and yes, you can, you know, quote unquote, be everywhere. But in reality, you're not actually reaching traction on any one of those platforms. And, and the reason for that is that every, con- every platform is different. The way that you produce a piece of content for video is vastly different to the way that you would produce a piece of content for a podcast or for a written um, form blog post. So blindly repurposing stuff tends to result in content that is not properly um not properly aligned for that for that platform the 
the the alternative way to do it, which is what we do at, at, at story learning, is for example, so we have a very popular video which is about how uh, U.S. military linguists get trained. Okay, so if you go into the U.S. military, how do you get trained? How do they train their people in language skills? That was one of the it was a real kind of um, knockout video for us. It's, it's got four or five million views. Done done really really well. We could have just transcribed that and stuck it on the blog. But instead, we took the original source content, the research that we did for the video, and then we worked with a writer to fashion that into a blog post, which is now formatted and, and presented in the way that a reader would expect. It's Google SEO optimized. It's a real piece of, a serious piece of work. you know. And so we, we treat every piece of content as, um, as we would if we, were, if we were writing it from scratch. The economies of scale come when you do all this media properly and you fully resource it because you can you can share the research you can share you can share the knowledge um, and that gets you that allows you to produce real quality content faster um, but that's very different from say hiring a a VA or a, 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 a content agency to repurpose stuff um, you know just just blanket. Yeah, thank you for talking about that. I think that we might be having a meta moment here. I might be guilty as charged, and I'll <laughs> I'll take this to heart. So thank you. Um, is it okay well, if I pull pull? Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it's worth, it's worth considering. Like, there's no. I'm not a big mm -hmm. fan of dogma um, in in any in any circumstances. Mm -hmm. But but I think you know if if you were to say to me, um, or 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 if, if anyone were to say to me, look, we've got these different these different media properties, but they're not really doing much. The first question would be, all right, well, let's look at how that content is produced in the first place. So it's not necessarily that anything is right or wrong, but it, where there's a symptom, there's a cause and, and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. And match each medium of maybe you are repurposing, but you're repurposing properly. Exactly. It, I mean, it, I think mm -hmm. fundamentally it's about understanding that every different platform has its own type of audience who consumes content in different ways. And if you're not tailor making content for that person, then it's unreasonable to expect that it should be very successful on the platform. That's fair. That makes sense. Is it okay, Ollie, if I pull up the blog and hrefs and kind of talk through what I'm seeing? Sure. Go ahead. Um, uh, so I'm very curious. It sounds like that, that blogging piece was key in the early days. So I just kind of want to, you know, have a case study and success here, if that's okay. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, all, so, it's all public information as far as I know. So. <laughs> as long as you pay for HRFs, right? So yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, we started life as an SEO agency and that was kind of my first channel. So I always like to look at this. So I'm in HRFs. I put in storylearning.com. I'm going to top pages because I was sort of curious, what are those top blog posts? This may not be the top, you know, uh, financially for you, but it's very interesting. I'm, I'm seeing keywords like Spanish conjugation, Japanese phrases, Latin numbers. To me, this is very uh, tippy top of funnel, you know, and uh, yep. hence why it's very high traffic. You're ranking superbly for these. It looks like number one for a lot of these phrases. Even advanced English words is kind of interesting, English conversation topics. And then I'm just going to guess if I go to one of these, um, People can learn more. People can read this blog post. This one says it's by you. And then all along the sidebar, I've got take the test, discover your perfect course, get the free tips. So it, there's, a, there's a pretty quick one, too, of we got in top of funnel. I'm trying to learn a very specific thing about a language. And then, oh, by the way, there's more. And I can see at the top, start learning Spanish today, seven-day free trial, get started now. So you have some very excellent offers. Looks like multiple that people can kind of opt in at different levels. And if they're, if they're finding your blog, then they're, you know, potentially finding your offers and getting on your list too. Am I thinking about that the right way? Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. with, with content, as, as you alluded to, you've got your top of funnel, your middle of funnel, your bottom of funnel. And the, you know, the vast majority of people land on your website, click away and never come back, but that's fine because it, it, it is to, to a certain extent, it's, it is a numbers game. Same with YouTube. I mean, we, we put out a video recently that got 1.2 million views in, in, in in about 10, 10 days, 14 days. Wow. Most of those people will never come back to the channel, but law of large numbers is there's a certain percentage who, who will. So, so really the way that I think about it is we are like, so I've, I remember I once heard Tim Ferriss say something, it was about 10 years ago. He said something along the lines of, um, he would rather make content that is like crack cocaine for 20% of his audience than make something very vanilla for 80%. And I think we, 
I've always taken a similar approach, which is like, I, I'm just not interested in doing this unless I'm making content that I'm, that I'm proud of. You know, I have no interest in just putting out random stuff for the sake of it. Life's, life's too short for that. And, you know, I have a background in art and teaching and all of that. I just, I just take pride in the stuff that we produce. So we've always followed um, a mantra of making the best quality content that we can. And um, I think in the long term, that's, that's, that's paid off because, you know, we've never really had a, a knock from Google, for example, in the, in the 10 plus years that we've been doing this stuff. And I think that alone speaks volumes. Um, I just think that, you know, if you're spending your life creating content, then you may as well, um, you know, as the, the great Dan Kennedy said, you know, there's, there's no strategic advantage in being the second cheapest. So you may as well be the most expensive. Hmm. That's well put. I, was, I had to pull out my phone here because the first thing I did this morning when I woke up, I texted my brother. I said, one thing Tim Ferriss was way ahead of the game on in four hour work week. If you make content about something, you'll become the expert of that topic, regardless of your credentials. Yeah. And that was in 2007. And look at us That's now. Crazy. So I yeah, think he, that... he was, he was, he was prophetic, prophetic in so many different ways. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing how much stuff has come out of his mouth has been lodged in my brain, uh, you know, over the years. Uh huh. I, I clicked to the Spanish course and it looks like what to me, I, I'm going to guess is a click funnels landing page. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. Yep. So, and you mentioned for how Dan much Kennedy, longer I don't, so... for how much longer I don't know, because click funnels is a, not, not, not been playing ball recently, but, uh, but yeah, currently is a click funnels landing page. Okay. So feel free to say more about that too, but I, I wanted to pull it up because we're talking content, but then you clearly do, you know, straight direct response as well. Um, so, you know, yep. the Dan Kennedy side of things, you know, the click funnel side of things. So you're, you're sort of doing it both. You're, you're creating very clear offers. There's no top menu here. Once I click to the Spanish course, I wonder if you can talk a bit about that, of those two different approaches of kind of the, the free content to get people in the top. But then when you make an offer, you're really doing direct response marketing. Yeah. I mean, um, so we've heavily, we've done some heavy CRO work on, on, on the, all of us, all of our sales funnels. Um, not so much on the website, something we should do more of, but, we, but essentially, you know, direct response, you know, for people, for people who aren't familiar, I mean, the, the, the kind of basic ethos behind direct response is that you can create an offer of some kind, which you can send out en masse to many people and generate a, an, an immediate response of some kind, whether that's filling in a form or sending a survey, making a product. And the, the whole game in direct response is endless optimization because direct response used to be expensive when people used to send out packages in the mail and things like that. You had not like an email where you send out an email for free. Every letter you sent out had a cost. And so you had to get very, very good at testing and optimizing. And I think because I was, I studied that world quite intently. I'm very familiar with copywriting, with direct response concepts. And so we've done a lot of that work um, on, uh, on, on our sales pages. And it essentially follows the principle that once we've attracted someone to the website, they've watched a video, they've read a blog post, they've looked at something we do, they are, by that point, as close as they're going to be to a, a warm lead who is interested in learning a language. And so at that point, our only job really is to is to present with the strongest possible offer that we can. And that means it involves lots and lots of things. Lots of things go into a strong offer. But what some of the things you see on that page, for example, are like right at the top of the page, you have the social proof bars, you have all the media that we've been in the BBC and so often that takes care of the credibility piece. We have a seven day free trial. So there's absolutely no risk in getting started. Um, we use strong language around learning Spanish quickly. We differentiate with the story learning concept. And if you start to scroll down, you, you then go into more and more depth with each of those pieces for people who need a bit more kind of logical, logical satisfaction. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, that, that, what you see here on this page is the result of a lot of, a lot of, a lot of CRO work, a lot of copywriting, a lot of testing, um, and interestingly, not much design. So I'm, I'm, you know, my feeling about design is that, you know, as the creator economy and the internet evolves, you get nicer and nicer looking content, ads, videos. And so actually the bare bones stuff is the stuff that actually st stands out because ultimately, uh, you know, any kind of persuasion or copywriting, is, it just comes down to words on the page. And so what we try and do is be very, very clear about our USP, 
very, very clear about what it is that we're offering, how we're different, and then just stating that in very, very simple terms um, on the website. Love this. This is this is a masterclass right here. Certainly a lot. A lot can be learned from this one. Ollie, I'm curious, when you say you do CRO work, is it you're A-B testing this page? You know, are you change, obviously, you're just, are you changing just one thing on the page when you do that? Are you optimizing for sales? Tell us about that process. Yeah, so the way that we approach CRO with sales is we use one single metric, which is value per visitor on the sales page. So there's lots of different things you can test. A lot of people will test things like conversion rates. That's often a bit of a red herring. Um, we are optimizing for value per visitor on the sales page, and we and we take that, we get that dollar number very very specifically. So when we are testing, for example, different price points versus a seven day free trial versus a payment plan versus a special offer versus what whatever, what we're looking at is the value per sales page visitor over a period of time. Because what that tells you is the holistic, complete view of the of, of the actual cash that you are collecting per visitor and so what we're trying to get to is a point where with the minimum number of people arriving on that sales page we are getting the maximum value possible from that so that's 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 essentially our north star and then within that there are lots of different variables but when it comes to testing like so for most people i, th I think a b testing for most people most of the time is a waste of time and the reason is that it's often very difficult especially in the, in the kind of context that unless you're driving huge volumes of traffic it's often very very difficult to get statistically reliable data and if you're doing things like price testing it's made even harder because you have to split your traffic in two um, you then have to uh, you have to then allow enough time for a, a significant number of buyers to to go through often you have a, you have problems with presentation of that so if you if you're talking about your offers elsewhere on on youtube or podcasts or whatever or in emails people can find and see different things when they come to your your pages and and often the things that people test are just really not that significant i mean you can get a 3.2 percent increase in your opt-in rates but usually for most people most of the time until you get to the point where you're making you know i'd say two million plus a year in revenue it's your the roi on your time is usually going to be much better placed elsewhere than 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 running around doing endless tests on things that likely don't matter. The the, the thing that we've spent most when we where we've done CRO when we've done A/B testing, it's been very specifically on those sales pathways through the website because that is the, that is the cash that that is the money right there. Um, but you know, but other stuff. You know, we don't go into a great deal of debt. Well, so when we do tests, they're usually very big tests. And one of the things that I learned, um, I think it was originally from Russell Brunson when I was in his mastermind back in 2015, very smart guy there, um, whose name I'm going to forget. But he gave me a piece of advice that I've never forgotten, which is when you're trying to get something to work, always lead with large tests because those big swings from one extreme to the other are more likely to get you to find the true center point of what you're what you're trying to go for um those large tests are how you get really meaningful results um they're also difficult to do um and so yeah that's <laughs> that's why for most people most of the time is usually not not a good way to spend your time does that large test mean we're not just changing the color of a button we have a totally different page yeah. and we want to know which page which one's on the right track you and, and it start you know what's the number one lever you have to pull it's the offer so usually it's the offer itself that changes so is it a seven day free trial is it a uh, three hundred dollar single payment plus bonuses um is it a do we break the course up into three different bits and sell the first bit and the other two bits get sold in a one-time offer all, all, all of these different things well you, you you know nothing really matters in your entire set in your entire sales process if the offer is off so you start with the offer you do big tests on the offer to to find which is converting the best and then you kind of work your way systematically down down from there so it's offer and then usually pricing and then headline and then you know all, all those things you we work your way through but but again usually it's like that the offer the offer is the thing that's going to make the most difference and it's where most of the testing should be done but 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 for, for, for technical and sort of ecosystem reasons, it can often be very difficult to do that unless you've got um, adults in the room, as my mentor says to me, plus uh, enough traffic to actually properly get the data you need to establish what's working and what's not. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, 
I just want to dig in there because this is so valuable. It's, it's not even CRO in the sense of it's not conversion rate optimization. It's conversion value optimization. It's someone hits this page. How much is that worth? And that's, it sounds like including upsells and things like that down the line. I'm curious, do you guys also control that for um, the, how people got to the page? I see, you know, I clicked to this page right through your website or I Googled it. That was an SEO. You know, if someone comes from an email, if someone comes from a Facebook ad, I imagine those traffic sources will all convert at different rates as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we do track conversion from different sources. It's practically impossible to actually run tests that are that are segmented by traffic source because again, your volume of traffic is going to be so low, it would take you two years to get a result. At least at our, at our traffic levels, it would. Um, you know, so 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 you've got to pick your battles. You know, so there are there are things that you can control for. There are things that you could control for, but would be very difficult. And there are things you can't control for. And, you know, to zoom out a little bit, what, would, what we try to do is to get holistic understanding of what go, what's happening in the business. Where do people come from? Where do our buyers come from? Uh, what kinds of, and, and then so what kinds of media work best? What kind of sales vehicles work best? We get an intuitive sense for that. And then, but usually before the point where we start kind of testing things till we're blue in the face, I tend to then at that point take a step back and say, right, look, we know that we have buyers who come, a significant number of buyers who come from our blog, from our YouTube channel, from books, from affiliates, and from referrals. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our, um, our growth budget for the year, and that budget is going to go into continuing to expand those things. We could track it, but honestly, tracking is impossible half the time anyway. So we're just going to place our, our belief in the value of future audience and say, we believe that if we grow, continue to grow these, these different audiences over time, that can only have a positive ROI. So let's put the resources where they need to be. Let's continue to grow what we need to grow. And then we kind of know where the chips are going to fall. But in the meantime, we can move on to more valuable stuff like, say, new product development or or, or, you know, line, line item extensions and what have you. Fantastic. I have to ask you about the book strategy too, if you have time to talk about that. Yeah, of I'm course. Looking at your books here on Amazon, I don't know if that's the best place to see, but um, I've seen some examples here. So I see you as an author and then it's kind of short stories in Spanish, um, short stories in French. So it's kind of short story examples in, in different languages. Talk to me a bit about this channel. I don't know if Amazon's the right place to look. I saw you have a, them on Audible too, but just m maybe talk a bit about this channel. Like you said, these are almost like paid leads that then maybe take the courses, right? Yeah. So we have at this point over a hundred books. Um, half, so I'd say about half, maybe maybe one third are from a traditional publishing contract. So we have uh, uh, we have books with um, Hachette, who are one of the I think the world's second or third largest publisher. Um, we have those books in. I think 23, 24, 25 of those across a bunch of different languages. Um, those are the ones that you'll see in bookshops. So if you go to any Barnes and Noble in the US, for example, you'll see those books uh, there. But we also have a self-publishing operation. So we publish our own books um, internally. Those are not in the shops currently, although hopefully by next year they will be. But if, if I have my way, they will be. Um, and And the idea here is that well, you just want to reach different audiences. And typically, your person who is reading a book in the park is not then sitting at home and watching YouTube. It's a different kind of person. The person who sits watching YouTube typically isn't reading blogs on the train in the morning. So there are all these people from all different walks of life who consume information in different ways. Our products in particular are based on stories. And so reading is a fundamental part of that. And so one of our main constituencies, if you like, is readers, people who read books. So it makes sense for us to have books, to make books about language learning that people like and enjoy independently. You know, most people will never even come to our website, let alone buy anything. Um, but we take the same approach as we do for YouTube or for the blog, which we we aim to create catalogs, a you know, large catalog of great language learning material that's based on stories. Um, sometimes our existing audience will go and buy those books. Other times those books will reach new audience and they will come and find us and then 
you know, come to the website and have, and have a look around. It works both ways, but you know, it's, it's simply a different audience source. It diversifies where we get people from. Um, and it creates huge amounts of goodwill because people just love books, especially when they're, when they're done well. And, um, and so, you know, we, that's, that, that's what we do. We have a, a whole publishing, publishing division within, within the company. It's small, but it's, but, you know, we work on putting out new books all the time. And, um, and it's, yeah, it's one of, one of my favorite parts of what we do. Oh, cool. Wow. I was also sort of thinking as you're talking about Barnes and Noble and physical bookstores, I was like, we may have to even describe those someday because not everyone <laughs> will have set foot in one. Right. Um, I, I yeah, well, love... not everyone will, but yeah. then, but then yeah. I think that's part of that's, <laughs> that's the great thing about this. It's like you, you, mm -hmm. you, you, I mean, for a start, you don't have to reach everybody. Um, but, but to the extent that there are different people out there and they can be reached at scale, it's an, it's an opportunity. And, you know, we, we hear about AI constantly at the moment. I, 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 I tweeted the other day, like for, for everyone who's worried about the impact of AI on their business, my wife still buys her clothes from mail order catalogs that get put through our, our, our letterbox at home. So, you know, if, for every new development, there's an opportunity that opens up elsewhere. And, um, and I think, you know, books in particular are, are hugely, um, underutilized by by people especially marketers marketers do a terrible job of writing books because it's always a thinly veiled lead magnet of some kind and, and it's so transparent i think there's huge huge opportunity to actually do 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 good do good stuff in that world hmm. how interesting well i see I, I see now you've got a great link for people to check out the case study anatomy of a 10 million dollar online education business um, is there any, you know, where else should people check out what you're doing all if they want to learn from you? Yeah. So if you want to learn about, you know, the, the, the more businessy side of things, then the best thing to do is to go to ollierichards.co. Um, that's where you'll, you'll find the, the case study that you mentioned. It's a, it's a, it's long, it's 117 pages. Um, and I basically describe in great depth how my language learning business works. So we cover, um, marketing piece, we cover, the, the branding piece, the sales piece, plus a lot of stuff we didn't cover today, like um, like the organization structure, how we build a team who manages all of these these things. People's favorite chapter about that, funnily enough, is the the last chapter I wrote on 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 lifestyle and about how to kind of manage business and life. That's been that's been <laughs> strangely the chapter that people have written me the most emails about. But anyway, you can download that for free when you join the newsletter um, at ollierichards.co, and you can find me at, uh, on Twitter as well at Mr. Ollie Richards if you want to connect. That's excellent. I know you, before we talked to you said a lot of this, this is, you know, um, education materials, or maybe I might say info products or something, you know, maybe you could reflect a little bit on, you know, how does, how do these lessons that, you know, you've learned and you've taught us about and that you talk about, how might these apply to e-commerce? Yeah. So info and e-commerce are obviously on the face of it, different things. Um, they work with different dynamics, but but ultimately marketing in particular is, is, is constant. I mean, that's the thing that actually gets people to buy. It doesn't change much among, among different industries. That's why these, these, these principles can be applied equally to, to B2B, you know, because the person sitting in an office reading their emails is also bored and also wants to be entertained. Um, so, you know, the idea that business emails have to be dull and boring is, 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 is crazy. And so, you know, really when it comes to e-commerce, I think the main thing that e-com can learn from the, the info business or the, or the online expert world is the, is different ways of presenting brand and USP. And, you know, the, the, the thing with physical products in particular is that because they're very tangible, I think people fall into the trap of thinking, well, People can see what they are. They either want it or they don't. But so much goes into making a, a purchase decision, you know, from from your emotions around the brand, whether you know, like, and trust them, the clarity of your of your USP, your unique selling proposition, your emotional connection to the brand. You know, some of the best e-commerce brands out there create amazing content that highlights the backstory of the brand, the origin story. They show how the how the thing is made. They introduce you to the people that. Um, around uh, the people who are responsible for making it and then email marketing so much e-commerce email marketing that i see is just based around ever increasing scarcity and discounting but actually the way to appeal to people on a on a more human level is to use email to to tell stories to put your your content in front of them show you show people what makes you different what makes you more 
what makes your product valuable, all the love and, and care that's gone into building that brand in the first place. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a big opportunity, I think, for, for people in the e-commerce space to actually um, reflect on what their brand truly is and what it can become. And I think, uh, well, certainly lots of those lessons are, you know, the, at, at the core of what I write about in the case study. So, um, you know, if anyone wants to read that, I think it would be helpful. Awesome. Well, such a, such a masterclass here and so many channels and so many business principles, certainly, like you said, if what, whether people are in e-commerce or B2B or what have you, there's a lot to learn here. So I really appreciate it. All right, Richards, thank you so much for coming on, sharing what's working in e-commerce and what's working in educational products. Thanks so much. It was a really good uh, conversation. Great questions as well. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm.